and socially it was difficult too. So when we had um, um, dancing classes with um, the Auckland boys, grammar, um, most of the Chinese girls uh, weren't asked to dance, this is dancing practice, and we would be sitting there uh, wondering what to do. So you sort of felt you were different and you realised that um, it, um, we didn't actually belong to the, the Western uh, world at that point in time. Wellington Chinese hold a picnic in Athletic Park. The uh, I don't think it actually did change um, for us because most of us went either to Chinese Bible class, Chinese socials, and we made our own fun, went to Chinese picnics, had Chinese basketball and sports, and we were always involved with other Chinese, and we were fortunate there was a whole lot of us growing up together. And um, they sent us to the Chinese school, which started in the early 1950s. We learnt to use the Chinese um, brush and do proper characters and go over and over the same characters till we got it right. We have very strong memories of being told constantly to speak Chinese, to speak the Chinese language. And as a group, as a family of young girls, we always rebelled about this. We didn't want to, so we always spoke English and only spoke Chinese to our parents. I guess they wanted to keep the language you know, alive. And um, yeah, he, that's why they were one. That they could see, you know, that we would lose it, lose our identity. Yeah. Hi, yeah. <laughs> Ginny was the youngest of Uet Sen's six daughters and one son. She was the only one to have a tertiary education. The others left school at 15 to work in the fruit shop. Um, yes, um, I have to say that I always had this um, slight resentment that I was never allowed to to, yes, to to carry on studying. And, yeah, I used to think that I would have liked to... I was um, never allowed the opportunity. Mm. Yeah, and um, so consequently, I just, that became something really important to me for my children. Faye Gok left school at 15 when her dad bought a fruit shop on Karangahape Road in Auckland. Joe's uncle came to our shop one day uh, for a cup of tea and a like this thing. Then uh, he introduced us and there we, we hit it off and that's how we met. Of all the Chinese market gardeners in New Zealand, Faye and Joe Gok are known as the most innovative. In 1956, they leased 160 acres near Auckland Airport. They led the way on many fronts and prospered. We like to be ahead of people, but we, we, even now we're still trying to think of something different. Now in their 80s, they show no signs of retiring, but when they do put down their spades, it will be the end of an era. My grandchildren that will go do their own profession. I haven't got any son to carry in a market garden. I think when it's time for us to stop, we'll just have to close up or hand it down to somebody who's keen on it. The Goks have never returned to China, but for the other families, visits back were important touchstones with their culture. Ginny was just 15 in 1966 when she visited China with her mother. It was Yuet Sen's first journey back since fleeing 27 years earlier. The Cultural Revolution was in full swing. The hotel was very, very Spartan, and uh, I remember they used to have the communist songs blaring throughout, throughout the um, hotel all the time. Um, big, long, Spartan rooms with about 10 beds, I think. <laughs> Hard wooden um, bamboo bamboo beds. And I think um, even in Macau, when we stayed at my auntie's for over a month, um, I think after one night, they, I think they, they realised and they 
and they even bought a, a mattress for me. <laughs> it's another homecoming today. Ginny, Gwen and their sisters Florence and Anna have returned to their old home in Cambridge. This home was the first Chinese family home built in New Zealand, a stake in the ground for Chinese settlement. Got all the old doors and everything. It's great, gosh. isn't it? Oh, it's my wonderful gosh. to see the place. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Oopsie. Yeah. Looks the house was sold a decade ago when both parents passed away. Oh my god, it's still here. Oh, this is what my my brother did. And so, oh, let's have a look at the record. Johnny Horton, North to Alaska. Oh my God, that was my favorite. Oh, here's the Chinese ones. These were my father's ones he used to like listening to. Oh God, I can't believe it. See, oops, oh. <laughs> That's Mum's village. Another glimpse of the past. In 2005, Lily Lee and Rita Fong visited their mother's village in China. Rita and her mum fled from here in 1939. It is Rita's first journey back. <laughs> Lily's daughter Mary Ann was with them, and her son Peter did the filming. As we walked through the house, which is now deserted and broken down, um, and with my kids around me, um, I think that was very moving. I used to have a photo here of Dad, and uh, Dad was so handsome and young, and yeah. I always it it helped me to understand my parents and what my mother had been saying about her life and, and how hard um, and the poverty. Um, so all those things that she talked about, um, the, yes, they, they became very real. It helped me with my identity as a, as a Chinese person. It confirmed to me uh, that I was Chinese. I had a Chinese heritage. It was there all around me, this ancient civilization with its own culture, its own um, richness and art and history and writing that went back 5,000 years. And so I felt very good about who I was. I think that it is different from uh, my mum's life. And we are different people. Um, and I, I think what's happened is, is we have actually evolved into being Chinese New Zealanders. These Kiwi Chinese families descend from strong, groundbreaking women. They came from the humblest beginnings, refugees brought in by a reluctant government. But with joy and luck, love and laughter, they lit the way for those of us who follow. This program is made with funding from New Zealand On Air.